Artificial sweeteners are pretty polarizing. Some people swear by them and others are convinced they're the worst thing for your health. What does the research tell us about? Let's talk about that. How's it going guys? My name's Richie Kerwin and today we're gonna to talk all about artificial sweeteners. What they are, why they're so popular, what are their benefits and what negative effects they might have. As always, I wanna point out that I'm not recommending you use a particular sweetener. What I am going to do is help you understand what the research says about their pros and cons so you can make a better, more informed decision about using them or not. Let's get started. First off, what even is a sweetener? Basically, it's a food additive that gives a sweet taste to food, but has far fewer calories or virtually none compared to sugar. You might ask, why would people want to replace sugar in their diet? There's nothing inherently wrong with sugar itself, but added sugars in food can contribute to people taking in a lot more calories than they normally would. You can add a lot of sugar to food without increasing its volume a huge amount, which means it can make food very calorie dense. And sugar also improves the texture and moisture content of food as well, which makes them sweeter and a lot more enjoyable. That makes food more appealing and a lot easier to overeat. And that's really the main issue with added sugars. They make overeating a lot more likely, which makes weight gain a lot more likely too. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying sugars cause obesity because sugar is often found in a lot of other foods together with fat adding to that calorie density. If you can replace sugar with something that still tastes sweet, so it still makes food appealing to humans, because we naturally have a sweet tooth, without adding all of the calories of sugar, you can potentially help people to lower their total calorie intake and either lose weight or help them maintain weight loss. Because of this, artificial sweeteners have become a multi-million dollar industry. At this point, I also need to talk about the elephant in the room. The word artificial, in artificial sweeteners really does put some people off using them. This is because of something called the naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy is the idea that anything that is natural is inherently good, and anything that is unnatural or artificial is inherently bad. This is terrible logic. Let me give you an example of that. One of the most toxic substances known to mankind is botulinum toxin which is 100% natural. On the other hand, there are a lot of artificially produced compounds which are incredibly beneficial to human health. For example, many of the new varieties of antibiotics which save people's lives or artificially synthesize vitamin D which can cure deficiencies. Saying natural is good and artificial bad is overly simplistic thinking. Because of that, sometimes people use other words to describe artificial sweeteners and say things like non-nutritive sweeteners or non-caloric sweeteners. I should also point out that there is another group of sugar substitutes known as polyols or sugar alcohols. These include such common sweeteners as sorbitol, mannitol, erythritol, xylitol, which many of you probably have heard of. While these sweeteners are often considered to be natural because they're found in nature, many of them are produced industrially by hydrogenation of sugars, for example, which shouldn't be confused with hydrogenation of oils or by fermentation. The difference between sugar alcohols and non-nutritive sweeteners is that sugar alcohols do provide some calories, but they are generally much lower than the calories found in sugar, usually between 0.2 and 2.5 calories per gram, compared with four calories per gram in sugar. Unfortunately, that's all I'm gonna say about sugar alcohols today. Instead, I'm gonna talk about non-nutritive sweeteners. Some examples of which include sucralose, often known by its trade name Splenda, aspartame, Acesulfame potassium, or acesulfame K, otherwise known as ACE-K, and stevial glycoside, which many of you will probably know as the natural sweetener, stevia, or also mogracide, which is naturally found in monk fruit. Just to give you a little idea of the difference between some non-nutritive sweeteners. Sucralose is the world's most commonly used artificial sweetener and is about 300 to 600 times sweeter than table sugar. It's heat stable and is often used in cooked food products. The Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, states that there are about 110 different studies which were used to confirm its safety as a food additive. Aspartame is about 180 to 200 times sweeter than sugar and is not heat stable so it's not suitable for cooked foods or baked goods. According to the FDA, there are over 100 safety trials that confirm the safety of aspartame. ACE-K is about 200 times sweeter than sugar and is heat stable, so again, it's used in cooked foods. According to the FDA, there are over 90 safety trials confirming the safety of ACE-K. As for the natural sweeteners, stevial glycosides, which are an extract from the stevia plant, are about 250 to 300 times sweeter than sugar. Each sweetener also has an ADI, or an acceptable daily intake. An ADI is calculated based on how much of a substance a person can consume every day without 
any health effects and has a huge safety margin built into it as well. That means if you consume something up to its ADI, you are still nowhere near consuming enough to have a negative effect on your health. For example, the ADI for sucralose is five milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. For a 70 kilogram person, that's 350 milligrams per day, meaning you'd need to use over 26 individual serving packages of sucralose a day just to reach the ADI. And that's still nowhere near the amount that would be harmful. Other sweeteners have similarly safe ADIs. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of different sweeteners on the market, all of which can have different properties and effects. That means that you can't assume that the effects of one sweetener will be the same as another. Don't some sweeteners contain methanol? This is another issue related to aspartame. I already mentioned that when aspartame is broken down in the body, it forms aspartic acid and phenylalanine. It also releases a molecule of methanol, which indeed is toxic. However, the amount of methanol that's released from a moderate intake of aspartame is actually far less than the methanol we normally get from fruit and vegetables that we eat daily, which occur totally naturally. There's a really important saying in toxicology, the dose makes the poison. This means that something can only have a toxic effect when its dose is high enough. A good example of this is vitamin D. If you don't get enough vitamin D, you can suffer from a lot of health issues. But if you get too much, for example, by taking excessive supplements, it can have toxic effects in the body. Don't forget, the dose makes the poison. What about cancer? This is another common question I hear about sweeteners. Oftentimes, when a study says something really bad about a food or a nutrient, if someone hears that, it tends to stick in their memory. And that's why a lot of inaccurate information tends to persist as so-called common knowledge. There have been a number of studies that have shown that high intakes of aspartame can cause an increase in tumors. Now, that sounds really scary until you read those studies. Firstly, these studies were carried out in rats. While experiments in rats are really important for human health studies as well, oftentimes something that happens in rats or mice doesn't happen the same way in humans. We're different animals with different metabolisms, and those metabolisms react differently to different foods. The classic example of this is chocolate. Chocolate is quite possibly one of the most popular sweet snacks on earth, and dark chocolate is even known to have health benefits. But if you give chocolate to a dog, it will kill it. Why? Because dogs metabolize chocolate differently. Some of these studies were also carried out in the prenatal stage, which means that female mice were treated with aspartame while they were pregnant, and the offspring were then fed aspartame for the rest of their lives. You can't compare giving a substance to a fetus in utero, while it's in the womb, with taking lower doses of it as a fully formed human being. Finally, these studies also used incredibly high doses of aspartame, which is perfectly normal for a toxicity study, by the way. The ADI for aspartame is 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And some of these studies used up to 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. That's not a dose of aspartame that a human would ever consume normally. Anytime a substance is associated with a very serious condition, such as cancer, we need to take that seriously. And that's why we perform all of these scientific trials to determine whether it's safe or not. As I mentioned, aspartame has already been deemed to be safe by the FDA in over 100 scientific trials. But because those mice studies were sensationalized by the media, they're forever burned into the memory of the population. And this is why people are continuously suspicious of aspartame. In science, we have to base our judgments on all of the available information that we have. And that information does change over time as we perform more studies. At the moment, the consensus of studies is that there doesn't seem to be a link between artificial sweetener consumption and cancer in humans. Now, I'm a scientist, and that means I have to change my mind when I'm presented with new evidence. So if some new evidence comes to light in the coming years that makes me change my opinion about artificial sweeteners, I will. Aren't they just as bad for your blood sugar as real sugar? This idea gets bandied around a lot. Let me clarify one thing straight off the bat. Non-nutritive sweeteners can't directly cause your blood sugar to rise because they don't contain any sugar themselves. No sugar in the sweetener, none entering your bloodstream, no increase in blood sugar. A different side of that coin is overall blood sugar control. There is evidence that the sweet taste alone, without any sugar or calories, can cause insulin levels to rise a small amount, without food even entering the stomach in some people. This is called the cephalic phase insulin response, or CPIR, and it happens in response to the expectation of food. It's also a considerably smaller rise in insulin compared to the second phase insulin response to sugar. That said, the CPIR is not necessarily 
a negative effect. What would be worrying is if non-nutritive sweeteners had an effect on blood sugar control. But a recent meta-analysis, that's a study that looks at the combined results of a number of similar studies, found that sweeteners, including aspartame, saccharin, steviocides, and sucralose, did not elevate blood glucose levels. What about causing you to want to eat more sweet food? Well, there was a recent study that asked this question and found that artificially sweetened drinks actually reduced desire for sweet food and drinks immediately after consuming them. Now, there is a possibility that using sweeteners very often might make you want more sweets in general, but we don't have any hard evidence to say that this actually happens. We do, however, have good evidence from multiple randomized control trials using different types of sweeteners showing artificial sweeteners don't cause people to overeat calories in general. It just doesn't happen, despite all the rumors you may have heard. Ah, and here's my favorite. Don't they cause weight gain? This idea comes from observational studies. Just to give you an idea, observational studies are where you take a group of people and measure something about them, like their height or weight or health status, but don't actually do an experiment or intervention with them. These early studies found that people who used non-nutritive sweeteners were more likely to be overweight. Here's the thing though. This is likely an example of something called reverse causation. For example, when people who have overweight or obesity start using non-nutritive sweeteners to help lose weight, this produces a false association between sweetener intake and obesity. However, there is a lot of data from well-controlled studies that show that sweeteners do help with weight loss efforts. They do this in two ways. One, by replacing the calories that would normally be found in sugar-sweetened foods, especially sugary drinks. And two, by helping people to manage hunger or cravings for sweet foods. Here's the thing. Many people, including myself, love sweet foods. And the food industry figured that out a long time ago. That's why added sugars are found in so many different foods these days. It's cheap and it causes people to eat more, which means people are more likely to gain weight. If we can satisfy people's desire for sweet food without adding all of the calories of added sugars, it makes it more likely that people will eat less, unless they decide to compensate later to congratulate themselves for having one sugar-free product in the day. You might think that sounds silly, but that's exactly how humans think. Finally, for anyone who likes to think that artificial sweeteners are as bad as sugar, Think of it like this. If someone drinks a lot of sugary drinks and that causes them to gain weight and develop conditions like diabetes or fatty liver or high blood pressure, simply switching to artificially sweetened drinks might be an incredibly easy way to help them lose body fat and improve their health. In that situation, which is better? Using sugar and having a higher risk of developing a load of conditions associated with calorie excess or using a sweetener? which has no definitive associations with any negative health effects. Like I said, I'm not here to tell anyone to use artificial sweeteners or not. Whatever you do, I'd just rather you make your decision from an informed place. So did this answer your sweetener questions? As always, if you have any more, let me know in the comments below and remember to like and subscribe to the MyProtein YouTube channel for even more great evidence-based nutrition information.